turned on all of it. And now officially, welcome to Conversations with CAGT. My name is Dr. Colleen Ehrlich. I am the immediate past president for the Colorado Association for Gifted and Talented. And with us tonight, we have got Catherine Fishman Weaver and Jill Klingen. And I'm going to uh, introduce them quickly, and I know they're going to tell us more about themselves as they get started. But Catherine Fishman Weaver is an educator, author, and international lecturer. As a public school teacher, she worked to expand access and equity for neurodiverse students who receive special and or gifted education services. Catherine continues this work by serving as the executive director of Mizzou Academy, a global and blended K-12 lab school at the University of Missouri. Through this role, she has led conferences and workshops in Brazil, Vietnam, Canada, India, and across the United States. A prolific and celebrated author, Catherine has written and co-authored six books in education. These titles frequently appear on bestseller lists in gifted education. Catherine also serves as an associate teaching professor in school leadership and community engagement, and as court a court appointed special advocate for youth who are navigating the foster care system. Her work has received state and national attention, including references by the US Department of Education. Thank you for being with us today. And then Jill Klingen is an assistant professor of professional practice for the College of Education and Human Development at the University of Missouri and department chair for composition and literature at Mizzou Academy. As chair, she works with high school students who are pursuing a dual diploma and has authored two high school language arts courses and co-authored an interactive grammar resource. She has also traveled to Southeast Brazil to work with schools and lead and present at international education conferences. Jill holds a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in English literature, and before teaching at Mizzou Academy, she homeschooled her daughter through much of elementary school and taught writing and literature classes at Kansas State University. Additionally, Jill co-authored the book series Teaching Women's and Gender Studies, Classroom Resources on Resistance, Representation, and Radical Hope with Catherine Fisher Fishman Weaver, sorry, and her work has appeared in West End Neighbors, Practicing Families, and Grit. So welcome, thank you for being here with us. So today the topic is going to be at teaching women's and gender studies in the gifted classroom and a little synopsis of it to, before we get started. So just in time for Women's History Month, CAGT is proud to offer this session on teaching women's and gender studies in the gifted classroom. Gifted learners frequently present with emotional empathetic depth, a heightened sense of justice and an astute awareness of social and global issues. These traits make women's gender and studies a compelling exploration for the gifted classroom. However, as in general education, women's and gender studies is often missing from K-12 gifted programming. Our speakers this month, Catherine Fisherman Weaver and Jill Klingen, are passionate about filling this critical gap in curriculum and practice. And we've already talked about your recent book, but from there, we are going to turn it over to you and we very much look forward to it. So thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Um, what what an intro. Oh, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up our slideshow. Um, and and Jill and I will take just a moment to say hello. I you, I don't know that you need any more information about us. You you know know me better than my mom now. Um, at least in terms of scholarship. So let me just start off by saying, if you're watching this in March, happy Women's History Month. If you're watching this outside of March, happy Women's History Year, um, because Jill and I want this work to continue um, beyond March. I've been so excited for tonight um, for a long time. Um, so we started, we received the invitation to speak to you all in November. And since then I knew today was gonna be a special day um, because it's all of our favorite things wrapped up into one session. We've got women's and gender studies, we have books, we have teaching, we have inclusion. Um, I get to be here with my friend and colleague, Jill Klingen. So here we are, and it's the first day of spring, and I think the snow has even melted in Colorado. It's a beautiful day here in Missouri. So I'm super excited, and I want to turn things over to Jill to get to say good evening as well. Yes, I just I want to say that it's such an honor and so fun to be here. This is a topic that Catherine and I have been passionate about for a really long time and working together for a really long time. And that passion evolved into this book series and then evolved into us being here with you tonight. So thank you so much for inviting us here. And we're excited to, to be here with you this evening. Because we're teachers, 
Um, I'd like to start us off with a question. Um, and I hope this question can kind of serve as a tether um, throughout the presentation. So our question is, what does it look like to center resistance, representation, and radical hope in your work with gifted young people? And I want to just acknowledge kind of right, right away that there are so many different ways to work with gifted young people. Um, so work with gifted young people might include parenting or raising gifted young people, um, might include teaching gifted young people, coaching gifted young people, might even include being a great neighbor to that gifted young person who lives down the street. So as you think about what your role is with the gifted young people who brought you here um, this evening, Jill and I want you to think through some of the themes of our book series, which are resistance, representation, and radical hope. In what ways are these themes already alive in this work? And uh, where are the opportunities for us to continue to advance this work uh, to bring about positive change in our communities? The image on the slide is the San Francisco Women's Mural. Um, this is um, a piece of art that we study in the book series, which you'll learn more about as we as we go through the presentation tonight. Um, it's also significant to me. So I learned how to be a teacher uh, working in Oakland Public Schools in a K-8 school. Um, and I had the gift of working with Miranda Bergman, who is one of the muralists behind the San Francisco Women's Mural. She was the art teacher at our school. Um, and so I'm just really excited to get to start this presentation um, already with positive memories of a teacher who is doing really amazing work um, with gifted young people to center resistance, representation, and radical hope. So the 2024 Women's History Month theme is women who advocate for equity, diversity, and inclusion. So this theme is about speaking up and working for fairness in our institutions and within society and really that theme of equity, diversity, and inclusion really just sets the stage for what we are going to talk about this evening. Um, Women's and Gender Studies is a really compelling exploration for gifted students, but unfortunately, as in general education, Women's and Gender Studies is often missing from K-12 gifted programming. So in this session, we really hope to explore the potential of women's and gender studies in the gifted classroom and provide some ideas and resources for integrating this content in your practice for whatever subject that you teach. teach. And um, our latest book series uh, begins to fill this critical gap in curriculum and practice, but uh, we also really want to acknowledge that it is the work of you as educators and the work that your students do in your classrooms and communities that really brings it to life. So we are excited to share some ideas with you that you can explore with your gifted students. So you all, this is a, a powerful moment to be teaching. And I, you know, we could say that at any moment in history, but this is the moment that we are living and teaching in right now. Um, and I just want to say that I have learned so much um, every year that I have gotten to work in schools, including this year. Um, and one of the lessons that I've learned is that the time is right for integrating women's and gender studies into the middle and high school classroom. Uh, throughout our presentation, we'll share some stories from how we've done this in our own practice. Um, and I thought I'd start with one right away. Uh, so as you heard in our introductions, Jill and I, through our work with Mizzou Academy, get to work with young people all around the world. Um, and Jill and I both do a lot of work um, with young people in Brazil. And across much of our content, we connect whatever it is we're learning to social issues, to the United Nations, sustainable development goals, um, to work that matters in communities. We want young people to learn that they don't have to wait to start making a difference. They are already the leaders that our world and our communities need. Um, and so just as these books were being released, I was doing some work with two high school um, young women 
who were engaged with our curriculum um, and they had they were learning more about SDG 5. Um, so SDG 5 is the sustainable development goal that focuses on gender equity. Uh, and they wanted to use their voices to, to make a positive difference. And one of the ways that they did that is through launching an Instagram platform where they shine a light on gender justice, equity, discrimination, and through that platform, um, these two young women have gained an international audience. Um, they are facilitating a global dialogue about how we can advance the work of one of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I know that there are examples like this in every, in every school, in every community all around the world. And tonight, uh, we get to celebrate some of those stories. So in our book series, we define feminism as an affirmation of humanity that seeks freedom from oppression and commits to the full access of social, health, economic, and political rights and opportunities for all people. So I know this is a big definition with big ideas to think about as educators and to introduce in our classrooms and for students to work through. So we have included an, act, an activity. Um, it's in the first unit of both our middle school and high school books to help students work through all the different parts of this definition. We include a reproducible chart that has broken down each component of the definition. And we invite students to look at that chart and then discuss and collaborate in small groups about what each part means to them and to their peers. For example, what does affirmation of humanity look like? What about health rights and opportunities? And what does it mean that these are affirmations and rights for all people? We all have some preconceived ideas about what feminism is. So this activity is a really thoughtful, powerful way to open up a dialogue about feminism. And it also honors the variety of experiences that each student brings in a really unique way and also just creates a really rich space for uh, exploration, thought, and discussion, which is really important and which is something that's very much a foundation of our of our book series is just being able to talk through things and figure things out as, as you go. Because the students at this age, uh, middle school and high school, this is what they're doing. This is what they're figuring out. So we want to create that space for them. So the chart for this activity is actually included in our book's free learning resources. And we will actually talk about how to access those free resources at the end of our session. But in this space today, we're just going to break um, some of these ideas down a little differently. This isn't an interactive classroom space, so it's a little different than what you'd be able to do in the classroom. But we're just going to take a couple of the components. But before we do, just because it's, it is such a kind of a big, heavy definition, I want to just read it through one more time. So feminism is an affirmation of humanity that seeks freedom from oppression and commits to the full access of social, health, economic, and political rights and opportunities for all people. So we're just going to pull a couple of these concepts and go through them a little bit. If you were in the classroom space, you'd have the reproducible chart that you could use, but um, since we're over here on Facebook Live, we'll just, we'll just improvise a little bit. So the next slide says that feminism commits to the full access of social rights and opportunities for all people. So if you were brainstorming this in your classroom, what might this mean? Some ideas that might come up is that feminism advocates for the end of gender-based discrimination and for equitable social rights and opportunities like healthcare, um, clean water, housing, rights within the justice system, and just within all areas where there is not equity. And then something that we talk about a lot in the book, it comes up um, because it is such an important issue, is that we also recognize the intersectionality of oppression. And so feminism also advocates to center the experiences of those who are marginalized to create a more just and inclusive space. So if you're a teacher in a classroom, this can be translated into several dis um, you know, different disciplines. If you were a social studies class. Um, you as a teacher could talk about the social right to clean water. 
if you're teaching a criminal justice class, you could discuss social rights within the justice system. Um, students in an ELA class could write up a presentation about creating inclusive healthcare programs in their community. And it's also important to think about that included in this commitment to the full access of social rights and opportunities is also access to participating in gifted education programs. Um, access to gifted education is a social justice issue and children of color, children for whom English is not their first language and children in lower income areas are less likely to receive access to gifted, um, gifted education. So feminism advocates for policy reform and institutional changes to create that equitable, um, empathic, inclusive society, which of course includes our classrooms and also, and this is the exciting thing as an educator, it begins in our classrooms. And we have that opportunity to help students sort of begin to create that space for themselves and see how it relates to their world. So the next slide says that feminism commits to the full access of health rights and opportunities. So some of the health rights that feminism commits to include health education, so that individuals can make informed decisions about their health care. These rights also include access to quality health care, including preventative, um, reproductive, maternal, mental health, and emergency services. And we also, again, um, as I mentioned on the last slide, acknowledge how the intersectionality of systemic oppression in marginalized communities contributes to a health crisis that can only be solved by providing quality, equitable care to everyone. And some of our exercises in this book, some of the activities that students can do can actually evaluate those sorts of gaps in their community and see how students themselves can actually make a difference in their own community for this, for this, um, Sort of thing. And also, if you're a teacher, if you're a psychology teacher, you could explore mental health rights. A science teacher could research inequities in mental health care in their communities. And also, just tying again back to gifted education, we also realize um, the challenges that gifted students face who feel um, could feel a lot of stress due to their self, um, you know, their high achieving nature. Um, Catherine has actually written another book about this um, for high achieving um, young women that is incredibly helpful um, to help students with their social emotional health. And the gifted classroom can really be a safe space for these high achieving students to receive the support that they need and also be a springboard and being in the space of empathy and learning to help their community as well. So just next slide, just summing it all up, feminism is for all people, all people. And that ties back to the theme of this year's Women's History Month, which is again, women who advocate for equity, diversity, and inclusion. And that's what feminism does. That's what we hope to help do through this book series is advocating for equity, diversion, and inclusion for all people, including the specific needs of our gifted students. Um, as we continue this conversation about why women's and gender studies in the gifted classroom, as Jill was sharing the multifaceted definition of, fe of feminism, I was reminded of one of our most important student partners as we were working on this book series. Um, and so as Jill and I were writing, you know, at the same time where we're teaching and engaged in school leadership work, uh, and as as always, um, when you're serving in multiple roles, uh, your students, you know, they, they're they interested in, in all of your work in its different ways. And so we got to partner with a, a young man. He was a junior in high school at the time. Uh, and he, for his, one of our social studies classes, um, did an interview with his grandmother. Um, and he interviewed his grandmother about social justice issues and particularly gender justice and inclusion during the 50s and 60s in Brazil. Um, his interview is remarkably powerful. It's included in the book. You can read, you can read some of it, um, which he translated from Portuguese to English for us. Um, but that conversation that we got to have with him, and then I also got to know his grandmother, 
really for me um, affirmed this work that that we're doing. Um, so he's he's also a gifted student um, and connected with this content um, in ways that don't surprise me as a gifted scholar and yet feel really important to this conversation. So as we think about why women and gender studies in the gifted classroom, um, let's spend just a couple minutes kind of thinking about our gifted learners. Um, so I wanna acknowledge first that gifted learners are as different from each other um, as they sometimes are from their age level peers. Um, so recognizing that, what do we know about gifted learners? We do know some things. Um, we know some things about patterns of thinking, perceiving and feeling in the world. For example, we know that gifted learners often experience emotional and empathetic depth. We know that gifted learners often have an aptitude for advanced and cross-curricular connections. We know gifted learners have a sensitivity and a heightened sense of justice. Uh, some of us may have experienced all of these things already today in our work with students. Um, and we also know that they have an astute awareness of social and global issues. So as I think about what does the scholarship about women's and gender studies offer us, the connections abound um, for each of these bullet points that are unique to our gifted learners. Um, and so I've got a couple more classroom stories that I can share. I was teaching in a public high school and I was working with a student, a gifted student, who um, was a talented debater. And she was reviewing the speech and debate comments and scores that the judges had given over several different debate competitions. Um, and she noticed a, a striking and irrefutable pattern, um, which is that when the young men were debating, judges would often write, way to be assertive. Yes, you got your point across. Um, and when she and her peers were receiving comments, um, they would often be marked down for being too aggressive. And so um, my student published an article on this research for our school paper. And you all within uh, you know five minutes of the school paper being released, the whole school and particularly my gifted classroom, um, this is all we were talking about. I mean, it led to a really important dialogue about gender, about leadership, about voice, about agency. And this dialogue continued to carry us through the school year. Um, so if you flash forward into the spring of that same school year, I had a group of students come to me and say, we'd like to have a feminist conference um, here at school on a Saturday. We're gonna spend all day learning. You know, Will you help us as, as a faculty sponsor? And of course I said, yes. Um, and we're really fortunate that we live in a university town and we live in a university town with a university that has a women's and gender studies department. Um, and so that women and gender studies department was willing to partner with us. Um, and the students put together this, this phenomenal conference that really brought women's and gender studies into our school and into our curriculum in ways that we, we hadn't seen before. I wanna point out that both of these examples um, came from gifted programming um, and came from students, um, not, not from me as the teacher. Although I said yes, and although I was supportive, um, the ideas came from the students. I'll share some more examples um, where I had a little more agency in just a moment. Okay. You're watching. We're not interacting a lot because of the format. So I just, I'm gonna do a little check-in with you all and see how are you doing cognitively? How are you doing emotionally? You know, do you need to take a little drink of water? Take a deep breath. All of those things are okay. Stretch. No one can even see you. You can stretch all you want. And one of the ways that I'm going to attempt to wake up our brains is again with questions. So as an educator, I believe in the power of questions. The questions I want us to think about right now as we move into the creating section of our presentation are about art. When is art a form of resistance? I shared an example at the beginning of this session with the San Francisco Women's Mural. What are some examples from your own school? Um, I'll share some from my teaching practice in just a moment. How are art and justice related? 
how can young people use their passions, talents, and creativity for social good? Um, and that's, I think about this third question, so many examples from our gifted programs um, spring right to mind. Um, so I want you to spend just a couple moments thinking about the power of creating, the power of art, um, and how we can use art to advance social good. Here are some examples um, from my own classroom practice. So the art that you see on the screen before you was done by high school students in my gifted program several years ago. Um, these students all participated with me um, in research that was related to my dissertation at the time, um, which is on affective development for gifted young women from high school through the college transition. And this group of students that worked with me as part of, it was a longitudinal study. Um, and this group of students that worked with me on this part um, chose to present their data through the visual arts, uh, which is just profound. This was 100% their idea to do it in this way. Um, in all of my reading about methodology, I, I don't know anyone else that's done exactly what my students accomplished right here. Um, so they learned from me about photo voice where you can use photography um, and they took it one step further as our gifted students are, are often want to do. Um, and they instead use the visual arts and they created on these big canvases, powerful images, um, powerfully personal images um, that we then shared with our administrative team at the high school where I worked, with school counselors, with peers, um, with again, the Women's and Gender Studies Department came over some of the faculty um, to join the students in their gallery and showcase. The, this artwork changed the conversation about social emotional development and gifted learners in our high school. Um, prior to this project, with a few exceptions, gifted learners weren't thought of as a special population in terms of heightened counseling needs, um, particularly in, in kind of the general education setting. Um, so when we thought about students who might need more mental health or social emotional supports, um, our extraordinarily high achieving gifted young women were, were not on that list. Um, so these students were valedictorian hopefuls. Um, they presented in the way that we think about achievement in school, as having it all together, um, when in fact they had some things all together and other things they needed a lot more care and support with. And so this artwork changed that conversation. And so I'm I'm hoping that as, as you listen to my story, you're also spending some time just noticing the images, the emotional depth, the range, the stories that these students, um, by the way, many of whom don't identify as artists, um, were telling us about gender and achievement. And this all connects back to my earlier questions about how can we use art to advance a conversation about equity? Um, and how can we lean in and listen to students and the stories and the leadership that they're already sharing with us? So I am really excited um, to kind of springboard off of that and talk about artivism. So artivism is a new term that I learned as I was researching um, for these books that Catherine and I wrote and learning and being inspired by artivist quickly became definitely uh, my absolute favorite part of, of the book series. It was, it, I, it's not an exaggeration to say that that it was life-changing for me. Um, as poet Amanda Gorman says, all art is political and artivism is an expression of that statement. So artivism is a combination of art and activism whereby artists address injustice, inequities and other social challenges through creative expression. Artivists aim to increase awareness of social issues and reimagine and reclaim new possibilities through their work. So it is art plus activism. And art artivists use their creative work 
to challenge the isms that are in our society, racism, sexism, discrimination, also just any form of injustice and other social inequalities. And then they use their creative work to expose those injustices. And then the really amazing part of that is not just to expose them, but also then to imagine a new narrative. So the other great thing about artivism is that it can take on many forms. Like if I had to be an artivist by being a painter, it would be a very interesting, <laughs> probably not inspiring experience in the least. But I have other ways where I'm artistic, right? And so everyone has that in them. So artivism can take many forms, slam poetry, music, dance, mural, uh, performance art, chalk art, graphic design. I mean, just any form of creative expression at all can become artivism. And the gifted classroom is really a wonderful, expansive sort of space to study artivism and to allow students to explore how they might be artivists. So here on this slide, you can see three of the artivists that we explore in our book series. Um, Christine Sun Kim, her work is on the top left photo. She is a deaf person who is also a sound artist. And she uses drawing, performance, and video to just explore how sound functions in society, which when we stop and think about that a moment, we're here today, right? We're listening to this. It, it's everywhere in society and address the injustices that she faces as a deaf person. So this work here is part of a series um, that she did called Deaf Rage and Trauma, LOL. And she uses pie charts and graphs basically to diagram her lived experiences and then also to illustrate the rage that she experiences as she navigates this unjust and often inaccessible world to her. So it's pretty powerful to, um, if you have a chance to look those up. Also, just an extension activity in this lesson um, for students is watching her TED Talk, which is called The Enchanting Music of, Sound, of Sign Language. And that that's a very powerful TED, TED Talk, too. I'd recommend that. So Emma Amos was an African-American artivist who focused on themes of racism and sexism using painting, weaving, printmaking, and textiles. So even right there, we're moving beyond these traditional ideas of what makes art, right? Um, and thinking about printmaking, textiles, weaving. And she once said that as a Black woman, just walking into a studio was a political act. So the piece that you see here is, which is under Kim's work, is called Preparing for a Facelift. So this piece basically mimics a picture of what, you know, a picture of a woman, what you might see in a fashion magazine. And it's her expressing her experience as a Black woman in the art world. So this piece scrutinizes the physical toll of racism and sexism and the tyranny of cultural expectations for women's beauty. And this piece was part of other pieces that she did um, for an exhibit that I also just identified on those same, those same sorts of themes. And finally, um, really one of my favorite artists that we uh, explored in our book series series. Um, Shamsia Hassani, she is Afghanistan's first woman street artist. And the picture on the right is one of her works. Um, and you can find her works on her website. Um, there are many spaces online where you can look. I was um, exploring her work a little bit today for another presentation that I'm doing for Women's History Month. And I just sort of got lost on a rabbit hole earlier earlier this morning, just exploring her work. And it's just so powerful. Um, she said, I love this. She said, art changes people's minds and people change the world. So she uses her art in an incredibly brave way as a woman in Afghanistan, expressing herself so openly and publicly, just to remind people of the difficulties women Afghanistan women in Afghanistan face, but also in challenging this patriarchal sexist society, society also captures the faith, the face and strength of Afghan women. So you see the struggle, but then you also see the hope. And there's just such a it's just so beautiful how she's able to communicate both of those really deep, really real experiences. So in our book series, of course, scholars get to learn about these artivists. 
but they can also participate in artivism and uh, they can use their own creative talents to advance justice, which is really exciting and challenging and amazing. So we have included projects in our um, book where they can create their own street art. They could create a mural, collages, chalk art, just any expression that they can think of to challenge injustice and inequity and to reflect these ideas that we want to communicate in our book of representation, resistance, and radical hope in both a creative and a political way. Said it was a really exciting moment to be teaching. It's also a really exciting moment to be learning. Uh, and so as we are, we're coming to the end of of the formal presentation, I know we'll have an opportunity to dialogue in a second, which I'm excited about. Um, but I want, as we come to the end of this formal presentation, us to spend a moment thinking about learning. Um, so not only what are the gifted young people that we work with learning, but what are we learning uh, as human beings, as community members, as educators, as family members? Um, and how are we forming learning communities together that are engaged in this work of making the world a better place. Um, that work can feel really brave. And so I always like in every presentation to remind the audience um, that you are not alone. Um, and this is true in education as well. And so I want us to spend a moment thinking through who are the colleague allies that you can go to for problem solving and support I shared at the beginning of the presentation that I had a really important relationship with our art teacher. When I was first learning how to be a teacher, um, she took me under her wing and helped me to engage in work that mattered with my students in ways I would have never thought of on my own. I continue to lean on my community and my colleagues as a learner myself. Um, and I want us to think together about who are those people for you? Who are your people in this work? Also, I want us to think about care. Um, the teaching, all teaching is deeply meaningful work and also can be heavy work. Um, teaching gifted learners, um, teaching women's and gender studies is deeply meaningful work and it can be heavy, complicated, courageous work. So I want us to spend a moment thinking about what does care mean for you? Um, how are you taking care of your students? Yes. And also how are you taking care of yourself as you go about this journey? Next, I want us to think why. Why teach women and gender studies in the gifted classroom? Jill and I have shared some ideas we have about this question, um, but ultimately this is a question for, for you all. So as you think about what might this look like in your gifted programs, um, in your work with gifted young people, this is your question. Um, and I suspect as you think about who are your colleague allies, how are you taking care of yourself and others in your community, and why are you engaged in this work? Um, that the answers will be profound. Um, I believe that they will point a very exciting and purposeful way forward. And I believe that that reflective learning matters. And so with that, we want to create a space to talk, teach, and dialogue about women's and gender studies in the gifted classroom. Um, and so this is the point where we will take some questions, um, and then we can also share some resources at the end. Thank you both so much. Um, so neat to see just all the different pieces that you are able to pull in um, from just all different cultures around the world. So thank you so much. And I love that saying, um, art changes people and people change the world. What, what an amazing quote to take, take away. Um, I will definitely be sharing it with the art teachers that I work with um, in hopes that they have heard of her. And if not, um, have them hear about her. <laughs> so thank you guys so much. Um, so uh, I think one big question that a lot of the people who are viewing this, whether they are viewing it live or whether they are do, um, viewing it um, as a recording, 
is just any specific um, examples or advice that you have for using these opportunities in the classroom, um, both at the middle school side and the high school side. Um, how about I'll share a couple examples from middle school and then let's hear from Jill on high school. Perfect. Um, okay. So as I think about middle school, um, okay, it almost goes without saying now that you've spent this this evening with us, but of course I think of art um, and we've talked about how we can use art for social good um, all evening. And so I'm going to share some different examples, but I want to share those different examples, not at the expense of art. They're in addition to art, right? Okay. Um, so one of the things that I found to be really powerful with middle school learners, and we've done this with high school too, but particularly in middle school, um, is to think about how women's and gender studies connects to um, their own lived experience and story. And not only in the moment now, so not just what am I experiencing in the hallway um, or what am I experiencing at the debate competition, both of which are valid places for us to explore women's and gender studies, but who am I within a broader narrative? Um, and so we encourage our students to learn with an elder. Um, for many of our students, though certainly not all, this can be a grandparent or great grandparent. And to think about what are the ancestral stories that we're living forward? And also what does it mean to be a descendant, right? Um, so what is our legacy? Um, I found that middle school students can connect in really profound ways to recognizing themselves as the protagonist of their story and the work that you do as a protagonist to make the community a better place and how that connects to those who came before you. So we talk a lot in the book about on whose shoulders are you standing, but also to the community that is coming next, right? So we, we talked earlier in the session about we believe that you don't have to wait to start making a difference, that already our young people are the leaders that our community needs. Um, kind of mapping this trajectory has been a really great way for middle school learners to, to put their arms around these different concepts. Yeah, Thank and you. I think that, so, oh, sorry, I was just gonna say really fast, ahead. I think that that point of like, whose shoulders are you standing on? Love it. and very powerful and could definitely in itself really spur a lot of learning and thinking. Jill, yes, high school. So, yeah, so the, and not, we talked a lot just to kind of backtrack a second to the, um, on whose shoulders you're standing. We talked about that a lot as we were writing this book. And part of that, just if anybody wants to go, go look at it, it comes from Amanda Gorman, um, Amanda Gorman's Ted talk. And she talks about that in a really, really powerful way. And that sort of became the, um, you know, the honor of the shoulders that Catherine and I were standing on as we were writing these books. And then also the honor of who we were passing this, passing this on down to. So I don't know. I think, you know, in high school, the same, it's, it's just the same sort of progression as starting in middle school, these thinking, questioning ideas. I have a, I have a 16 year old son and, you know, one of my favorite parts of the day is dinner because, you know, we sit around the table and he just, he has all these like, you know, ideas. He's, um, he's in an IB Lit and Lang class and he had to like compare a song with like a thing happening. And so he was like, I don't know. It's just, so we're, you're, you're in that space where you can compare like art with what's happening in the world. And then you can take that and you can make it relevant. Like, um, like my son, for example, was talking about, um, just with the recent election in, um, uh, Russia and the person who was like pouring ink into, into the ballot boxes. Right. And he was comparing that to this Simon and Garfunkel song about, uh, that was singing the silent night, singing silent night with like seven o'clock news going under it. So it was just, it's just this idea. And that is sort of what we really want to do, um, in our books. So, and just so that they can realize they make those changes now. So for example, um, we have an activity with, you know, with climate change and students, you know, you can look at all these like amazing people who are our age, right. Who are doing this work for climate change, but students study who, you know, people who are their peers who are doing work for climate change. And then when they see their peers can do this work, they think, oh, 
well, where, where can I do this work? And that is really the challenge and the exciting thing about, um, I feel like about our book series is that we want to take these ideas that are really important. And then we want to distill them down to how can students be change makers now? Not like when they grow up, after they go to college, whatever their degree is, but what they can do now. Which I think is also so important, right? We I know we talk a lot to our um, uh, to our staff, to our students, uh, just what's within your control and what's not within your control and the distinction between the two and realizing that although there's a lot that's not in our control, there's actually more in our control than maybe we originally first thought, right? So even getting them to think about that and that excitement is amazing. So thank you. So obviously this is a series um, and one question is just why did you decide to write it in a series rather than um, in a singular book? Well, that's an interesting <laughs> question. <laughs> so we started out to write it in a singular book and we had so much to say. <laughs> um, and we work at a K at K-12 school. Um, and so we were having these conversations in middle school and we were having these conversations in high school. We're also having those conversations in elementary school, although there's not an elementary book yet. Uh, yeah. And so as we were working, um, we had more content um, than is appropriate for one book. And we also wanted to infuse enough intentionality and care. So back to those learning questions. Um, to create the space um, that says some of the conversations we have in grades six through eight uh, may be related to conversations we have in grades nine through 12, but they have their own important nuance. And so how can we um, create the right space to think through content in ways um, that are developmentally appropriate um, for, for the different age bands? And we know that in, with gifted learners, that can be complicated even further. And I think we realized that, you know, we could scaffold this work to be like a continuing work. And yeah, I will never forget the day that it was just like, um, I think we have two books here. <laughs> and then, and then what, what we had to do to try and try to figure that out. But, um, it was, you know, then it ended up really coming together and, and making sense. And really that sort of the impetus of, of this book series is that Catherine and I would work together every year on a teaching resource for women's in history, for women's, you know, for this month. And it sort of, we built on it and we built on it and then decided, oh, well, maybe we have enough here where we could start working on a book. So it's kind of neat, just the organic way that it started. And um, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing it here tonight. Um, here are the books, Teaching Women's and Gender Studies, grades um, 6 through 8, 9 through 12, available through Rutledge. And thank you so much for um, joining us and spending some time with us tonight. Catherine Fish um, Fishman Weaver and Jill Klingen, thank you guys so much. And with that, we are going to uh, call it a night on Facebook. So thank you so much for joining us. And we will see you next time at our next Conversations with KT. Hey.